Ananda, as far as the Aryan realm extends, as far as, as its uh, trade extends, this will be the chief city, Pataliputta, scattering its seeds far and wide. And Pataliputta will face three perils from fire, from water, and from internal dissension. Uh, stop here for a moment. So the Buddha uh, foresaw uh, that uh, this town that they are building, uh, called Patali Gama, in the future uh, will be a big prosperous city uh, called Patali Putta. I think even up to today, uh, it's a big city. Uh. Then Sunida and Vasakara called on the Lord, and having exchanged courtesy, stood to one side and said, May the Reverend Gotama accept a meal from us tomorrow with his Sangha of monks. And the Lord consented by silence. Understanding his consent, Sunida and Vasakara went home, and there had a fine meal of hard and soft food prepared. When it was ready, they reported to the Lord, Reverend Gotama, the meal is ready. Then the Lord, having dressed in the morning, took his robe and bowl, went with the Sangha of monks to the residence of Sunida and Vasakara, and sat down on the prepared seat. Then Sunida and Vasakara served the Buddha and his Sangha of monks with choice, soft and hard foods, till they were satisfied. And when the Lord took his hand away from the bowl, they sat down on low stools to one side. And as they sat there, the Lord thanked them with these verses. In whatever realm the wise man makes his home, he should feed the virtuous leaders of the holy life. Whatever devas there are, who report this offering, they will pay him respect and honor for this. They tremble for him as a mother for her son, and he for whom devas tremble, ever happy is. Then the Lord rose from his seat and took his departure. Sunida and Vasakara followed closely behind the Lord, saying, Whichever gate the ascetic Gotama goes out by today, that shall be called the Gotama Gate. And whichever fort he uses to cross the Ganges, that shall be called the Gotama Fort. And so the gate by which the Lord went out was called the Gotama Gate. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says uh, that if a family uh, or certain person uh, makes constant uh, offerings uh, of, of food, etc., uh, to uh, holy men, to, to those who lead the holy life, la, uh, ascetics, monks, etc. La. Then the devas will protect him. La, uh. So it is by our actions uh, that we are blessed. La. And it is by our evil actions uh, that we are cursed. La. Nobody can bless another, nobody can curse another. La. It's our actions that decide. La. Good actions will bless us, evil actions curse us. And then the Lord came to the river Ganges. And just then the, rivers, the river was so full that a crow could drink out of it. And some people were looking for a boat. Some were looking for a raft. Some were binding together a raft of reeds to get to the other side. But the Lord, as swiftly as a strong man, might stretch out his flexed arm or flex it again, vanished from this side of the Ganges and reappeared with his Sangha of monks on the other shore. And the Lord saw those people who were looking for a boat, looking for a raft, and binding together a raft of reeds to get to the other side. And seeing their intentions, he uttered this verse on the spot. When they want to cross the sea, the lake or pond, people make a bridge or raft. The wise have crossed already. The Lord said to Ananda, Let us go to Kotigama. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Kotigama and stayed there. Then the Lord addressed the monks thus, Monks, it is through not understanding, not penetrating the four noble truths that I, as well as you, have for a long time run on and gone round the cycle of birth and death. What are they? By not understanding the noble truth of suffering, we have fared on. By not understanding the noble truth of the origin of suffering, of the cessation of suffering, and of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, we have fared on round the cycle of birth and death. And by the understanding, penetration of the same noble truth of suffering, of the origin of suffering, of the cessation of suffering, and of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, the craving for becoming has been cut off. 
the support for becoming or being has been destroyed. There is no more re-becoming. The Lord having said this, the welfarer having spoken, the teacher said, not seeing the four noble truths as they are, having long traversed around from life to life, these being seen, becoming supports pulled up, sorrow's root cut off, rebirth is done. Uh, so here the Buddha says, uh, we keep on the, the round of rebirths, uh, samsara, because we don't understand, don't really understand uh, the four noble truths. Uh, when a person really understands the four noble truths, uh, then he becomes tired uh, of this long round of existence. Uh. The Buddha says, uh, we have been on this long round of existence for so long, uh, uh, we don't realize uh, so long that uh, if we accumulated, uh, uh, for example, the blood that was shed uh, when we were slaughtered as animals and we were beheaded because we did something wrong, etc., the blood uh, is more than the four great oceans. Uh. Mm. And similarly, for the tears that we shed uh, on the round of rebirths uh, is more than the four great oceans. Uh. So it is only by understanding uh, the Four Noble Truths, uh, really understanding. Uh, to understand the Four Noble Truths, uh, uh, we also have to understand, for example, the five aggregates of attachment, the six sense bases or dependent origination. Uh. So uh, some people don't understand. <clears throat> they think uh, the Four Noble Truths uh, is just elementary Dhamma. But it's not elementary Dhamma, it's the ultimate Dhamma. If you really understand the Four Noble Truths, uh, then you become an Arya, one of the eight types of Arya, or you attain liberation. Then the Lord, while staying at Koti Gama, gave a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom com becomes completely free from the asavas, that is, from the asava of sensuality, of becoming, of false view, of wrong views, and of ignorance. Then the Lord ha had stayed at Kotigama as long as he wished. He said, Ananda, let us go to Nadika. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks, to Nadika, where he stayed at the brick house. And the Venerable Ananda came to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side and said, Lord, the monk Salha and the nun Nanda have died at Nadika. What rebirth have they taken after death? The lay followers Sudatta and the lay woman followers Sujata, the lay followers Kakuda, Kalinga, Nikata, Katisaba, Tutta, Santutta, Bada, and Subada have all died at Nadika. What rebirths have they taken? And the Buddha said, Ananda, the monk Salha, by the destruction of the Asavas, attained in this life through his own super knowledge the uncorrupted liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom. The Nan Nanda, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, has been spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from that state without returning to this world. The lay followers Sudatta, by the destruction of three fetters and the reduction of greed, hatred and delusion, is a once returner who will come back once more to this world and then make an end of suffering. The lay woman followers Sujata, by the destruction of three fetters, is a stream winner, incapable of falling into states of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. The lay follower Kakuda, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, has been spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from that state without returning to this world. Likewise, Kalinga, Nikata, Katisaba, Tutta, Santutta, Bada and Subada. Ananda, in Nadika, more than 50 lay followers have, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, been spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from that state without returning to this world. Rather, more than 90, by the destruction of three fetters and the reduction of greed, hatred and delusion, are once returners, Sakadagamin, who will come back once more to this world and then make an end of suffering. 
and well over 500 by the destruction of three fetters, a stream winners, incapable of falling into states of war, certain of attaining Nibbana. Ananda, it is not remarkable that that which has come to be as a man should die, but that you should come to the Tathagata, to the Tathagata to ask the fate of each of those who have died. That is a weariness to him. Therefore, Ananda, I will teach you a way of knowing Dhamma called the mirror of Dhamma, whereby the Aryan disciple, if he so wishes, can discern of himself, I have destroyed hell, animal rebirth, the realm of ghosts, all downfall, evils, fates, and sorry states. I am a stream winner, incapable of falling into states of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. And what is this mirror of Dhamma by which he can know this? Here, Ananda, this Aryan disciple is possessed of unwa unwavering confidence in the Buddha. Thus, this blessed Lord is an Arahan, Samasambuddha, endowed with wisdom and conduct, welfarer, knower of the worlds, incomparable trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. He is possessed of unwavering unwa faith in the Dhamma. Thus, well proclaimed by the Lord is the Dhamma, visible here and now, timeless, inviting inspection, leading onward to be comprehended by the wise, each one for himself. He is possessed of unwavering confidence in the Sangha, thus well directed is the Sangha of the Lord's disciples, of upright conduct, on the right path, on the perfect path, that is to say, the four pairs of persons, the eight kinds of humans, the Sangha of the Lord's Disciples is worthy of offerings, worthy of hospitality, worthy of gifts, worthy of veneration, an unsurpassed field of merit in the world. And he is possessed of morality dear to the noble ones, unbroken, without defect, unspotted, without inconsistency, liberating, uncorrupted, and conducive to concentration. This Ananda is the mirror of Dhamma, whereby the Aryan disciple can discern of himself, I have destroyed hell, I am a stream winner, certain of attaining Nibbana. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says, uh, uh, he's telling Ananda, if you keep asking me uh, where each uh, uh, lay disip uh, each disciple is uh, uh, reborn, uh, that will be very wearisome. Uh. But I'll teach you uh, how to see uh, whether you have become an Ariyala. The Buddha says uh, uh, the minimum is the um, stream winner, uh, here referring to the Sotapanna. Uh, the Sotapanna has these four qualities, uh, has unwavering faith, uh, uh, unwavering confidence uh, or sadda in the Buddha, in the Dhamma, in the Sangha. And he has the Aryan sila, Aryan, uh, uh, Aryan uh, morality. Eh? Uh, this Aryan morality, eh, as I mentioned before, eh, consists of the three factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, eh? right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Eh? And basically it consists of seven precepts, eh? uh, three body precepts, not to kill, not to steal and not to engage in sexual misconduct, and four verbal uh, precepts, uh, not to lie, not to carry tales uh, to cause disharmony, not to engage in uh, coarse, vulgar words, and fourthly, not to engage in idle gossip. Uh, so, uh, the seven precepts are extremely important. If you have these seven precepts and you learn the Dhamma, then there's a good chance you can understand and become a Ariyala. Uh, then the Lord, staying at Nadika in the brick house, gave a comprehensive discourse to the monks. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom, etc. And when the Lord had stayed at Nadika as long as he wished, he went with a large company of monks to Vesali, where he stayed at Ambapali's grove. And there the Lord addressed the monks. Monks, a monk should be mindful and clearly aware. This is our charge to you. And how is a monk mindful? Here a monk abides contemplating the body in the body, earnestly, clearly aware and mindful, and having put away all hankering and fretting, 
for the world. And likewise with regard to feelings, mind and Dhamma. That is how a monk is mindful. So this year, uh, mindful refers to the sati, la, sati sampajanya. Here it says mindful and clearly aware. Uh, so here, sati uh, is a practice of contemplating the body in the body, la, uh, contemplating feelings in feelings, mind in mind, and Dhamma in Dhamma, la, uh, having put away all here it says hankering and fretting uh, in other uh, translation uh, they say coveting and dejection that means uh, uh, don't covet don't uh, crave uh, for the things in the world uh, if you crave for things in the world and you cannot get it and then you experience dejection uh, here they say fretting uh, so it's the practice of sati and the next one is a practice of sampajanya which is uh, uh, general general mindfulness, general awareness. And how is a monk clearly aware, Sampajanya, Sampajano? Here a monk, and going forward or backward, he is aware of what he is doing. In looking forward or back, he is aware of what he is doing. In bending and stretching, he is aware of what he is doing. In carrying his inner and outer robe and bowl, he is aware of what he is doing. In eating, drinking, chewing and severing, he is aware of what he is doing. In passing excrement or urine, he is aware of what he is doing. In walking, standing, sitting or lying down, in keeping awake, in speaking or in staying silent, he is aware of what he is doing. That is how a monk is clearly aware. A monk should be mindful and clearly aware. This is our charge to you. Uh, so here, the Buddha is telling the monks uh, that uh, all the time uh, you should be... Uh, you should practice mindfulness of these four objects of sati. La. Don't let the mind stray. La. And to, to help you practice that, la, you should practice uh, general mindfulness. La. Whatever you are doing, la, put your mind there. La. Instead of letting al- allowing the mind la, to stray and think of this and that. Mm. A lot of people, as I mentioned before, uh, don't have this uh, even this basic mindfulness uh, being present. Uh, uh, the mind is always going off somewhere. Mm. Now Ambapali, the courtesan, heard that the Lord had arrived at Vesali and was staying at her grove. She had the best carriages made ready and drove from Vesali to her park. She drove as far as the ground would allow, then alighted and went on foot to where the Lord was. She saluted the Lord and sat down to one side. And as she sat, the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted her with the talk on Dhamma. And being thus delighted, Ambapali said, Lord, may the Lord consent to take a meal from me tomorrow with his Sangha of monks. The Lord consented by silence, and Ambapali, <clears throat> understanding his acceptance, rose from her seat, saluted the Lord, and passing him by the right, departed. And the Lichavis of Vesali heard that the Lord had arrived at Vesali, and was staying at Ambapali's grove. So they had the best carriages made ready, and drove out of Vesali. And some of the young Lichavis were all in blue, with blue makeup, blue clothes, and blue adornment, while some were in yellow, some in red, some in white, with white makeup, white clothes, and white adornment. And Ambapali met the young Lichavis, axle to axle, wheel to wheel, yoke to yoke. And they said to her, Ambapali, why do you drive up against us like that? And she said, Because, young sirs, the blessed Lord has been invited by me for a meal with his Sangha of monks. And they said, Ambapali, give up this meal for a hundred thousand pieces of money. And she said, Young sirs, if you were to give me all Vesali with its revenues, I would not give up such an important meal. Then the Lichavi snapped their fingers, saying, We've been beaten by the mango woman, Amba woman. We have been cheated by the mango woman. And they set out for Ambapali's grove. And the Lord, having seen the Lichavis from afar, said, Monks, any of you who have not seen the 33 gods, just look at this troop of Lichavis. Take a good look at them, and you will get an idea of the 33 gods. Then the Lichavis drove in their carriages as far as the ground would allow. 
Then they alighted and went on foot to where the Lord was, saluted him and sat down to one side. And as they sat, the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted them with a talk on Dhamma. And being thus delighted, they said, Lord, may the Lord consent to take a meal from us tomorrow with his Sangha of monks. But the Buddha said, But Lichavis, I have already accepted a meal for tomorrow from the courtesan Ambapali. And the Lichavis snapped their fingers, saying, We've been beaten by the mango woman. We've been beat, cheaten, cheated by the mango woman. Then having rejoiced and delighted in his talk, they rose from their seats, saluted the Lord, and passing him by the right, departed. Hmm, stop here for a moment. So here you see, uh, these young men uh, from Lichavi, uh, they, uh, they, these Lichavi young men, uh, they uh, uh, have a lot of blessings. Uh, and they, uh, they, look, they look very good uh, and they are very wealthy. And uh, so they dress up very well. Uh, and the Buddha said, uh, if you haven't seen the 33 gods, uh, look at them. Uh, they look exactly like the 33 gods. Uh. So this shows uh, that uh, some human beings, uh, we have uh, much blessing from the past. Uh. We have been uh, reborn from the heavens uh, down here. So we still retain some of this uh, uh, blessing. Uh. So the looks, everything. Uh. Uh, and Ambapali, when night was nearly over, having had hard, choice hard and soft food prepared at her home, announced to the Lord that the meal was ready. Having dressed and taken robe and bow, the Lord went with the order of monks to Ambapali's residence and sat down on the prepared seat. And she served the Buddha and his monks with choice hard and soft food till they were satisfied. And when the Lord had taken his hand from the bowl, Ambapali took a low stool and sat down to one side. So seated, she said, Lord, I give this park to the order of monks with the Buddha as, as its head. The Lord accepted the park, and he instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted her with the talk on Dhamma, after which he rose from his seat and departed. Then was, then was staying at Vesali, the Lord delivered a comprehensive discourse to the monks. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom, etc. Mm. Let's stop here for tonight. Uh, so here you see uh, this Ambapali, uh, she had a lot of faith in the Buddha. And uh, so she donated uh, this uh, piece of land. Uh, here it's called a park. Uh, it's like a... Uh, uh, how do you say, botanical garden like that. Now, I don't know what trees they are inside there. But uh, she donated it to the Buddha. And the Buddha accepted it on behalf of the Sangha. Uh, this Ambapali uh, is uh, sit here said to be a courtesan. Courtesan is like a geisha. Uh, 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 to, to be more costly, uh, like a high-class prostitute. Uh. Uh, in those days, uh, it was a uh, respectable profession, uh, just like the geisha girls of Japan. Uh. So, um, we find uh, in the Theri Gata, there are some verses uh, uh, by this uh, Ambapali, uh, which shows, uh, because she became an Arahan, uh, it shows that later she became a nun, uh, became a nun and practiced very hard and became an Arahan. Uh. This is a very long sutta, so it will take a few days, so uh, we stop here.